All right, welcome to you know, this podcasting. I'm your host, Connor, and I'm here with resident film snob, Calvin. How's it going? And I am really excited to do this movie. We're talking about Borgman today, and one of the reasons I'm so excited is this was suggested to us. So I want to thank Riri Nomad. Uh, they left a comment on our YouTube page. And honestly, I don't think I would have ever found this film. I don't think, Calvin, I don't think you would have ever found this film if it wasn't suggested to us. And yeah. it was a wild ride. And uh, for that reason, we're actually going to do a two-parter on this one. So I'm, I'm really excited. And again, go ahead and like leave a suggestion. I'm, I'm always ready and looking forward to do things that are you know, suggested to us rather than us kind of trying to pick someone, pick one for ourselves. So. Right. And I think part of the reason we're going to do a, a multi-parter on this one is because we watched it and we were like, what the hell is this? Like, <laughs> I don't think I've struggled with a movie this hard in a long time. Right. We were going to record our last meeting and we talked for a minute and you're like, I feel more comfortable if we watched it a few more times and like, yeah. let's like really dig in on this one. And I think this is a great movie for that because it is, it's, it's really ambiguous and I don't, I kind of spent a lot of it struggling to figure out what the point was, right. which is part of what made this movie like so intriguing to me. So again, mm-hmm. I'm really glad that we found this one. Yeah. I mean, how many times did you watch it through? I watched it three times. I actually literally watched it this morning before we recorded. So I, yeah, I did too. Well, I like, I spent a lot of time like, uh, jumping through it and stuff. I, I think I watched it most, I watched the ending at least three times. Um, I think a total, I watched it four times though. I think you could watch this movie out of order and it would probably make as much sense as if you watched it linearly even. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. A lot of the edits, like going back at first, I thought they were kind of, they were kind of weird. Um, they're, I don't know what it is about them that they give me a certain uneasiness. Oh, um, for sure. They feel like weird kind of jump cuts into the middle of action um, that I don't know what it means. It's a very strange style. But, yeah, I agree. Like, you could have done this whole thing non-linearly, and it would have been the same movie. Yeah, kind of, in a way, <laughs> yeah. Um, so this was directed by Alex Van Warmerdam. Uh, this is a Dutch film. It was released in t- 2013. It had a budget of 113000 which is, like, pretty modest considering it made a million uh it only made five thousand dollars opening weekend in the u.s and canada though so dutch films don't play well here yeah i'm surprised it was actually yeah i was surprised it was actually uh released here right i i, I mean i'm almost sure it was a limited release it didn't have like a mm-hmm. you know it didn't have your uh you know avengers endgame run <laughs> uh but but i mean at least it it appeared here which is kind of cool and it was an hour and 53 minutes and i'm not gonna lie it didn't feel that way to me no. it felt like it was There was always something happening and I was always questioning what was going on in a way that made me feel like this movie was paced out really well and I was never, I was never so lost that I felt like I had to rewind it constantly Mm -hmm. and when the end came around, I wasn't like, I wasn't shocked by it being like by it closing out and I also didn't feel like, oh my God, finally it's over. Yeah, exactly. And I think part of what keeps your attention is that it changes really sharply from what you thought was it was going to be this character study of this vagrant this uh homeless person and his antics and then suddenly he becomes a very different person and basically not in the movie and we we move on from there into something else right and i think that's what keeps your attention it's like what just happened right here it was like it was like uh, a change of pace of no consequence but it felt like everything was completely different right i i think i in my first impression, I, I thought that uh, I had a hard time understanding what the tone of the movie was supposed to be because I think part of it is it feels like it's changing, especially when like kind of your title character changes his name and then a lot of the characters change a lot with it. Mm-hmm. But there was this really dark nonchalantness to this movie. It's like you, as the viewer, I think you kind of inherently know that this Borgman character is up to no good, but all the characters surrounding him either don't seem to care about what he's doing and the manipulation he's pulling off or they're oblivious to it. And so that's part of what made this movie really frustrating to watch because I felt like I felt like I knew what was going on, but no one involved in the movie knew what was going on. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And that's that's kind of what I what I think too. Is like I go back and forth between whether this movie is a, a really intricate puzzle that I just don't get, or it's a movie that loves ambu- ambiguity for its own sake, and it ultimately doesn't mean anything. I think there's there is uh, some interviews that we've read uh, from the director von Rotterdam that suggest that he's taken influence from a lot of other postmodern works that suggest that um, this nihilism. Uh, 
of uh, not caring and like of not having a point is something that uh, he brought to this to the creation of this story as well, which is it only really feels like that once it ends, you know, right. it's not one of those things that you question. Like um, there's not a point like, ah, you know, there's no point to this at anywhere. Like you're trying to still figure it out until it just ends. And you're like, well, well, well I don't understand. Yeah, no, I, I get that. I just think there's enough, there's so much stuff sprinkled throughout it that it's like, Oh, like I think the movie means this. And then a couple scenes later, I'm like, Oh, I must have had it all wrong because now I think the movie is talking about this. Mm-hmm. And it's part of, we'll dive into more of our theories about it in the, the second part of this uh, review and discussion. But that was part of what kept me so interested. It was like, despite me feeling like I didn't know what was going on, I was still like very invested in what I was seeing, which is, I think is kind of a, a pretty amazing thing to pull off mm. to somehow feel like you're not really saying or doing anything, but still keep me like totally engaged to the point that I, I want to keep figuring it out. I think it's kind of a fascinating way to put a film together. Yeah. Which is so different from a lot of other postmodern work because a lot of, uh, a lot of postmodern stuff just likes to be, uh, weird and ambiguous to, as an antithesis of art and story, like the conventions of what we think of as entertainment. And so, yeah, to incorporate both of them at the same time is fascinating. I think you could also have ambiguity just for its own sake. To like maybe like pump up the way the director feels like, oh, like, can you even understand my film? Yeah. And I don't think this movie's doing that. I think it just has a lot of vague ideas that allow the viewer to kind of piece together their own version of this film. Right. And it's kind of similar to the to what Robert Eggers has said about, uh, especially in The Lighthouse, there's a certain level of ambiguity that he wants to bring um, so that uh, like he has his specific uh interpretation of what this is and that's that's part of what we're going through is like me as a as as a filmmaker uh when i was making films and seeing uh uh the rest of the people that i made uh films with like there's a specific intent a lot of times behind what we're making and why we're making but there's a level of like you know this can be whatever you want to it like i am putting myself into this and if it ultimately is something that i don't realize because it's happening subconsciously and you take away from it in another way like that's totally fine that's the whole purpose of all of this but generally there's um there's a specific intent with what we're trying to create and i think that that's why this is frustrating is because we can't we can't figure that out like is it ultimately he just doesn't want to say anything? Right. So I think before we go further into this film, just kind of give a like a brief synopsis on what it is. Uh, this character, Borgman, is, like we said, it kind of appears at the beginning as a drifter, a dirty man who's just trying to get a bath. He eventually kind of infiltrates this nice household. It's a, like a, a family with three kids, a nanny, well-to-do, and he he worms his way into it, becomes the gardener, and just over time he's slowly changed uh, kind of who I want to say is like the protagonist, the person whose point of view uh, this film is from is Marina and how he slowly changes her over time. And, you know, it ends up in this like really kind of tragic end, like the loss of her life and her husband's life and like their family is like torn down, kind of the whole, their whole station in life is changed. I think it's like kind of a, kind of a vague synopsis of how, how the story goes. But there's just so much little stuff in between all that. So let's like move on then uh, to an article I read by Katrina Dent on, I'm assuming it's not the most reputable site. It's from Data Stream Diva. Not to criticize her. <laughs> I just have never heard of this site before. But one thing she said is it's a pitch black uh, domestic comedy. It's a genre I've never heard of before. <laughs> what do you think of that genre? And do you think that this film uh, like fits that uh, like that terminology? Yeah, see, when I, when I was... First, when I first heard the term black comedy, I what I expected black comedies to be um, was something so bleak and dreadful that it was funny. You know, not it, we, like we got humor not out of uh, awkwardness, but out of like, wow, this is like <laughs> this is soul suckingly terrible. Right. And there are moments here like this, uh, like that. But a lot of times it seems like black comedies are like. We funny things happen in in a ter uh, because of terrible people, and it's ultimately not a funny thing, um, but just kind of the situations that happen are are contrived in a humorous way. And I think that there are just a few here, but I wouldn't ultimately categorize the tone as being humorous. No, that was my kind of issue with like that it being put in that genre. Is I think that like a black comedy, yeah, it's like a terrible situation or it involves terrible people. But the intention of it is to be funny. 
I don't think this movie is intending to be funny at all. I think there are plenty of movies that have comedic moments, whether it's due to like the timing or the reaction of a character. And it's wasn't written into the script to be funny. It's just the way it's either put together or edited. It You get a laugh out of it. Mm-hmm. This movie felt like it had those points in it, but it certainly wasn't intended to be a comedy. All right, so I want to move on now to the aesthetic, kind of the look of this film, the sound. This reminded me a lot of uh, the movie we did a little while ago, Anonymous Animals, which no one saw. Um, <laughs> it, was like, it was a silent, not a silent film, but it was, uh, there was no speaking in it. But I thought all the camera work was like really similar and even like the palette, I even thought. And like it's, it takes place in this wooded area. It has like the handheld cam. I thought a lot of the shot selections were pretty similar. Um, obviously, like I think this movie is better than Anonymous Animals. But I got a lot of like the same vibes in terms of like camera placement and like what we were, what we were seeing, like the aesthetic was like really similar to me. Minus the nice fancy house that's in Borgman compared to like the slaughterhouse that's in Anonymous Animals. But I, I got a lot of like the scenes of them like going through the woods felt the same to me. And and even the sound, mm. they're both like very limited on uh, using a score in this. So I thought it, they were similar in that way too. Yeah, the music plays very sparsely in here. Um, I kind of get what you're saying as when they're running through the, the woods at the beginning. That's kind of like anonymous animals. But I would say that overall the, the palette here is more saturated than anonymous animals. The camera work is a lot more steady if... if uh, uninteresting um but i can kind of see like in in certain elements i think anonymous animals had a very consistent style the whole way through the movie um whereas here where we we do we have a lot of tracking shots some zooms we have that one weird zoom on marina as people are driving away oh my god it i was so taken aback by it because nothing else in the movie does anything like that yeah like you said it it feels consistent mm -hmm. and so then to have just one shot kind of stick out to you it reminded me, I, I know you didn't see it, but like Spider-Man, uh, No Way Home had a couple shots like that. Oh, weird. Where it's just like, all of a sudden it just zooms in on Peter Parker. Huh. And it just felt like, part of the, what made that movie interesting is it kind of used a lot of different shot styles and techniques in it. Huh. And this one only used, I think like the one I can really think of. But yeah, I thought the zoom like really kind of caught me off guard. Yeah, yeah. And it's uh, something that calls back more to like, I, I imagine like from the 50s and 60s, a lot of the French New Wave, especially what I was thinking, like uh, um, some of Antonioni's films um, were, were what I was thinking is like this, this, that's a very old style. It feels cheesy now. Right. Um, but mostly because we've moved on to a lot, a lot uh, other, other technologies in terms of what what is cheesy and gimmicky about camera work now a lot of like what we do is we set up cameras and just let things play there's a lot of realism that comes out of uh the 80s especially like someone like tarkovsky i think tarkovsky has done um you can see a lot of his style and camera work in general here and i think that's another thing i wanted to mention is like tarkovsky likes to um really load the frame with uh with image with uh like hints, like there's a bust, I think, of Plato or Socrates and Solaris um, that really talk about the um, the overall philosophy of what, he, what he's going for in that film. And in a movie that, like Borgman, that feels like it's saying a lot of things, the mise-en-scene is really lacking. There's not a whole lot of interesting shots. Um, the, the frames don't seem to have um, any objects that suggest... Uh, any type of uh, imagery, any type of symbolism. Um, we don't have a lot of depth of field that we're playing with. The the, ca- the camera movements themselves don't feel very interesting. It's it's so I find it so strange that I watched this four times through and there's not a single thing that jumped out. I was like, wow, what an interesting shot for the way that we've placed subjects and uh, played with perspective. It's all about the things that were the the actual subject. Yeah, I I would say that probably the most interesting shot, also the most horrifying shot, is when the the couple is being loaded or like dropped to the bottom of that lake with their heads covered in cement. Mm. And and again, it's not particularly interesting. It's more graphic and visceral. And Mm. that's what makes it interesting. Like you said, it's, it's about... It's about the subject in the shot, not about making a visually interesting shot. So I think some of the scenes that stuck with me the most were more out of kind of shock value yeah. than it was out of like, wow, well, like what a really well put together, like it's framed really great and it, it's put this, it's put the subject in a, in a place that's interesting. This was more like, oh my God, like this is really happening. That's why the shot like stuck with me. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, the only other thing that I really think of as as far as what we where the camera language was really strong was when the family was watching the play. And it's not about the play that I find anything interesting. It's the fact that you have all, yeah, seven of these people. You have the the au pair, you have the children, you have Camille, uh, Marina, and Richard. And they're all just sitting, staring at the camera. And they're not saying anything. That whole, that whole play, nobody says anything. And you just look at all of the tension uh, between all of these characters, all of their vague motivations and how they've changed so much and who they are now like what does anybody want what is anybody doing what is anybody thinking this is after the children's surgery this is before Stinas. it's before her surgery but after she's had sex with pascal right um and it's uh, there's just so much um unsaid but felt there and that's the only thing i think in this in the only time in this movie that i really felt something rather than seeing it no i think you're right that whole scene could have played out and they don't even show the ballet Mm. you could have just had it on on these characters sitting there and like you said there's all this tension that we're aware of as the viewer and i thought like you said i think it's displayed really well uh that's probably yeah i agree with you it's probably the scene that conveys the most feeling Mm -hmm. um just through the context of it not what you're actually seeing so yeah no I, i agree with you on that one thing i wanted to go over is it's use of day and night in this film. Yeah. Yes. I, I got a lot of like midsummer vibes from it. While this is more, I think of like a, like a thriller in a way than a horror. Um, it has so many scenes that take place during the day. There's a lot of parts where Marina's like asking her kids. She's like, why are you awake? Go to bed. It's the middle of the day. I think gradually throughout the movie, it becomes, it takes place more and more at, at night. Uh, but I think about the dinner scene with uh, Stina's boyfriend and that takes place at night. And then obviously like when, you know, the ballet takes place at night, um, when Richard is killed and Marina is killed, all takes place at night. And I think like maybe visually that's supposed to show that Borgman is, he's moving in and all the light is being kind of shut out of this family. And so I think you could think of it maybe, that that's maybe too on the nose, but I think you could think of it that way. And that's one way I think like the way they chose to separate from daytime shots to nighttime shots, I think more of them take place at night. And I, I thought maybe that was like an interesting way to use it, but I was kind of thrown off by how much this movie takes place in the day for what is probably a really dark story. Yeah. I think one thing that's interesting to think about too, is we think about all of Marina's nightmares happening at night. Right. But all of the action takes place in the, in the day in the nightmares. Right. Whereas here now reality is at night. So I think that all of the, the darkest things are happening at night. Um, and I don't think that like, I will get into this a little bit more. I don't think that Camille and any of the rest of the crew, the group, the Faye, um, as, uh, one article I read, uh, put it, do you know what the, what the Faye is? No. Can you like fairy folk? Okay. Right. Is what Faye is. So we called them Faye, uh, because they seem to have some sort of magical quality about them. Right. So. I, I like that term better than the crew or the group because I feel like that's a, a weird tone uh, that there's a little – it doesn't say what these these people really are. I think there's, there is some other type of mystical thing to them. So I don't think that they're necessarily evil. Um, I think what they're doing is they're uh, giving light to the things that were, were already there, like the, the dreams that uh, Marina has. They're not being poisoned by Camille. They're, he's just giving them uh, – um, like they're being brought to the surface? Yeah, exactly. Like they're just being manifested. And so I think that's just a product of them being um, these supernatural creatures is the the things that we're most often afraid of, the things that, you know, I, I think that Camille is a type of incubus, uh, specifically an Alp. Right. Um, uh, and we'll get into what that means. Um I think that the, those things happen most at night, and that's really why all of the worst things happen at night and why the evil things happen at night is because that's when uh, these creatures act. Right. No, I, I agree with that. It was just interesting to me how much of this is in the daylight. Um, it makes it more uneasy, adds like an unsettling nature to do the film the same way I think it works in Midsummer, And mm-hmm. so that's why I, I, liked, I liked that that was a choice that they went with. Because if it's all at night, then it's like, okay, well, like, I know it's bad. I know it's creepy. But then to make it... Uh, add a, add that extra element by having so much of it take place in the day made it more unsettling to me. Yeah, because we also start to bring in then the the d- domestic tension with all of the children, which feels like a very different movie. Right. I did have, and this might be reading into it too much, 
But there was like some small things I noticed throughout this movie. One that I thought of is uh, there's a scene where Richard's falling asleep on the couch and he's watching this nature documentary and it's talking about uh, this leopard who's like creeping up on its prey. Mm. And to me, I thought it was a little bit of foreshadowing. It's like kind of Richard's asleep at the wheel here. He's not really paying attention to what's going on with his family while Borgman sneaks up on the family and he's about to you know, capture his prey. And I, again, might be reading a little bit too much into that, but I kind of want to give the director credit that you know he added a little a little nugget in there a little bit of foreshadowing i thought it worked well that way yeah yeah i uh i struggled with uh whether anything on on the tv meant anything other than maybe the one where pascal and ludwig are watching tv with him and they say it gets interesting the friendly chemist is actually a a, so, a serial killer i think that was you know a foreshadowing right like right. don't worry when uh camille was telling marina like don't worry things will be okay just be patient Okay, then, yeah, coupled with that, I think that there is some interesting stuff going on. Yeah, exactly. So we're moving on from aesthetic now. Let's get into the characters. Uh, Let's talk about Camille Borgman first, you know, the titular character of this. Uh, Apparently, uh, Alex Van Warmerdam originally wanted Mads Mikkelsen to play this character. You spoiled this fun fact for me because before we started recording, you were like, oh, yeah, it's Mads Mikkelsen was supposed to be in this, which, again, I'm the fun fact guy. You totally stole that moment from me. (laughs) But uh, I, I apparently they couldn't come to terms on like salary for uh, him appearing in this film, and that's yeah. why they moved on to uh, Jan Bouvet, uh, who portrays Camille Borgman. I thought it was interesting. We mentioned before how the characters start one way and then they end in a totally different place. Mm-hmm. I love how he comes across is initially as like a vagrant who just wants a bath, and um, he ends up developing into a character who has like this really sinister nature to him i love how he he kind of goats richard into beating him up that way marina will have sympathy for him later and that's kind of where his infection starts and then as the as the story goes on you get a better idea sort of of what he's going for i don't think his end goal is ever made clear but you certainly know that like he's up to no good and i kind of like that sense of ambiguity to it you don't know is he after the kids is he after marina is he trying to take over their home and move in himself? It's none of that is ever really resolved. And that's why I think he's like a really interesting character in that way. But I definitely think one thing that's really neat about him is how he starts in this really weak place. And then he ends in a, you know, as the kind of most powerful character in the movie, who's pulled off this big uh, uh, manipulation. Yeah, exactly. And so it's, it's funny, like him going, being, um, like his names are really interesting because you, uh, he starts as Anton, uh, Breskins. Um, and if you remember from the, uh, um, story of the white child above the clouds, Antonius is the cripple who goes down to, uh, rescue the remains of the child from the belly of the beast. So I think that's interesting. Um, We'll get into his first name in a little while, but Borgman is also an interesting name. It's gen. It was a it was a name given for landlords who worked for kings and royal aristocracy. So the fact that he ultimately becomes a gardener for uh, a Richard, which means uh, king. Um, oh man, it's etymologically traced that way too. I love that. Yeah, this whole thing can be seen then as a uh, as a feudal lordship, and where uh, Borgman has inserted himself into a position of power to take care of the uh, take care of the garden. But yeah, it starts as like yeah, like this character of uh, he's uh, running from the the priest and the the guys at the beginning, and um, you know just trying to get by we think that this is going to be a, a, some sort of social critique or, so, or so, like uh like a story about what it means to be homeless in uh late stage capitalist societies um that's absolutely what i thought when he goes to the first door asks to take a bath and he's turned away i thought it was i, I thought it was going to be a commentary on uh, like you know how do we don't take care of the people in need in our society that's what i thought initially the movie was about and of course Eight times throughout this movie, I had a different idea of what this movie was actually about. <laughs> yeah, I still have very different ideas. I don't think I have one cohesive idea of what this movie is. I'm kind of hoping this discussion will will give me peace. I don't know. I kind of want to move on. Like after like three weeks of like all <laughs> right. of this research and uh, um, still not like 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 chewing at this movie, but not getting it. Um, but yeah, so we move from a story about vagrancy. Uh, and then halfway through the movie, he moves into the house and then he's basically not in the movie for 20 minutes. Right, right. Like he's kind of there, but has no lines of dialogue. We see a lot of Pascal and Ludwig and Alonka and Brenda, but it's mostly about Marina and Richard. 
Yeah, so let's move on to Marina then. Uh, she's played by Hedwich Minis. Minis? How, how would you say it? Uh, You're better at the language than I am. I, I get, uh, let's see. Yeah, Minis? Okay. Probably. I mean, I'm saying it like with more of like a, a Swedish like accent because that's what I approach like a lot of the, the uh, Germanic languages with now because they all look very similar or like they have like a lot of the same characters. So I don't know if that sounds correct. I think that her accent a lot of times sounds like an English person trying to speak a made up foreign <laughs> yeah. language. <laughs> it it definitely I think some like like Richard sounded very natural to me, mm-hmm. even when he speaks English. But sometimes when I think it mostly threw me off when she's speaking English is when I was like, this accent doesn't sound quite right, you know? Yeah, well, it was when she was speaking speaking Dutch that I had a had a problem. Like she oh, okay. like at one point, like she's talking about like how she laid into him, and uh, or she's telling Richard that you laid into a man and he needs care, and she's like, for for short time. And like, and like that sounds like something out of South Park. Yeah, that's like all I could think of is like this sounds like someone's concept of what someone in ne- the Netherlands sounds like. Oh, okay, yeah, no, I I think that makes sense to me. It it does feel like <laughs> an approximation of the knowledge of the of the accent or an approximation of the language at sometimes. Yeah, I mean she is Dutch. Like she was born in the Netherlands, so she apparently can can speak it correctly. <laughs> I guess I just I'm not familiar enough with with Dutch to have a discerning ear for it. So she probably is speaking it totally normal. And my dumb American ears are just like, huh? Yeah. Well, and that's the thing. It's like, she sounds so different than I feel like a lot of the other characters, a lot of the other actors. And that's why it stood out so much to me. Yeah. I I could tend to agree with that. One thing I really like about her character is she kind of lays out what the story of the film is like, at least narratively kind of like how it's being plotted out. She's talking to Richard and she says, she feels like they're being surrounded by something uh, a warmth that slips in, but is also confusing, a shell of something that means harm to them. And that's part of why her character is so frustrating, is she recognizes w- what Borgman is, and she expresses that to Richard, and yet she still kind of falls for this manipulation. She she ends up, like, falling in love with him. Like, Well, and Richard even says, like, well, that's a delusion. Like, you're, uh, it, it's tiredness, you work too hard. He says that multiple times to her that she's overworked and she works too hard um but yeah and then this is where like the next line uh is where all of this starts to get so strange like where like it moves away from this story about vague like kind of this story about vagrancy you know about homelessness and i was getting a lot of religious vibes before but then you get this line where she says i feel so guilty we have it so good we are fortunate and the fortunate must be punished and so what does that mean like why does she think that Right. The, there's no motivation or reason to it. She seems to harbor this feeling uh, deep within her, and it's not expressed at any other time because she's she's a douche. Like she is like screaming at Stina, uh, doesn't care if Borgman kills the gardener, and I think that's like the the part where like we really get the sense of like Borgman not being like a good person. Like he's <laughs> like uh, poisons the gardener and then like goes shopping. I love I love that part where he's he's taking the gardener to his wife's house to his home and he stops at the hardware store to get the supplies to essentially like kill them and hide them. Yeah, I thought it was like I I mean, I had my mouth agape. I was like the audacity of this man. Yeah, to, and exactly. To have and a like, dying man in your car and then get the supplies to to kill him and hide him away. I thought it was it just showed like kind of the like again i think there's the really dark nonchalantness to this movie how he just did it like it was no big deal yeah and not only that like so he goes and buys these supplies and then he just leaves the cart in the parking lot Ugh, what a jerk that's when i knew i was like oh, put it this, in the cart corral this guy's an evil <laughs> <laughs> that, that was when he stepped over the line yeah that know? was like oh now i know who this person is <laughs> <laughs> but yeah like that's part of why this was a little frustrating as someone in the audience is we recognize the the horror of this character but marina allows him to sink his claws in further and like i said like it gets to the point where she's like touch me like i need you and she convinces him to kill richard and she's just infatuated with him and it's like why are you this way like we all can see that this is so wrong and you need to get out of there and like every other character in this movie that's like a change that she has yeah and i think like uh at first like that that's absolutely why i felt like this was so frustrating i did not understand her motivation so i went back and i just specifically i traced every action that she did so it starts with you know she doesn't know anton um but then she wants to help him bandages him helps with his slippers i 
you know, it impl- I think that it, the, the film implies that she really was a nurse and they did know each other at some point. I thought so too. I thought it made more sense if it was that way. But again, this, but movie, didn't, this movie didn't really have to make sense for me to feel like it was trying to say things. Mm-hmm. So, and it, the, But that was it. Like those, those were the only two elements um, of her being a caretaker or a nurse to, to Borgman. So we, then we move on from that. And then uh, Richard returns with the necklace and he, he puts it around her like a collar, you know, almost like a dog. Like, you know, like, I'm sorry that I misbehaved, but here everything's better now because I'm, you know, this is my fiefdom. Okay, yeah. Um, I thought that, that was interesting, especially when we'll get to dogs later. Um, but then, then she has the dream of Richard beating her. That was the first instance. And that's when uh, Borgman tries to leave. And she's like, no, 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 no. I want you to stay in some capacity. And I think that's that's the whole thing is they're, they're reminders. He, he's giving her reminders of what she doesn't like about this situation, about her relationship with uh, Richard. Um and that's why she keeps acting acting this way. There doesn't seem to be like any attraction towards Borgman. It's uh, um, I read a really interesting blog um, article from a uh, professor of philosophy. He has like a few PhDs. Like we can put the link uh, to the blog in uh, our YouTube uh, episode. It's really really dense, really dense, very confusing. But there are some things that I think read true. Like basically, she was keeping Borgman around as a means of exit from the domestic scene but she ultimately doesn't want to give up who she is so that's why she wants to get rid of richard she wants the she wants to be at the top of uh her situation like her little fiefdom and she doesn't want to lose anything that's ultimately why she wants to kill him so i think all of her at first her motivations don't make a lot of sense um which i th- i kind of think is a failing of the of the editing of the dialogue um, of it doesn't, it's not a very cohesive piece to track her all the way through because a lot of times we were paying attention to Borgman and then we realized it's really about Marina and her perspective. And then Marina doesn't seem like she's acting in a very coherent way because we missed parts that we thought were about Borgman, but they're really about her. Yeah, no, I think that's definitely one thing I realized partway through the film because it, it starts out with, it's about Borgman being tracked down by a gun wielding priest. And mm-hmm. so you think the movie's about him, but then I think the character who has the most one-on-one interactions is Marina. Like mm-hmm. she's either interacting with her kids or with the gardener or with her husband or with Borgman. And there are definitely some scenes that are just Borgman, but it feels like the story is revolving around her and her interaction with it. And that's why she does some really contradictory things that, again, make this movie a little frustrating. Uh, one of them being when she's talking to Stina, the nanny. And Stina wants to have her boyfriend stay the night because he's in the military. He doesn't get much time off. And Marina is like, absolutely not. I need to know who I have under my roof. He can come over and have dinner first. And immediately following that, you see, I think it's Ludwig. It's Pascal. Oh, is it Pascal? He's carrying a bed to like the little... uh, Across the lawn, her lawn. And she doesn't know who this is. Borgman's like, oh, introduce yourselves. And she's totally fine with Pascal and Ludwig being under her roof. And just their names too. She's like, oh, they didn't introduce themselves. Mm -hmm. And he's like... This is uh, Marina, and they're like, "Oh, oh, Pascal, Ludwig," and that they, they then they just stare at her, and then that's it. That's yeah, like, and that's... I think it, it's like you said. I, I think she does. She wants to have control over her situation, and and she she exercises that by telling Stina that she can't have her boyfriend stay the night, but she's also just her whole idea and and concept of the reality she is in is so warped by Borgman that she doesn't even notice that she is contradicting herself immediately after she's talked to Stina. I thought it was like just a really like kind of microcosm of this movie. Like she is one way sometimes and then she's the exact opposite in other points in the movie. Or I think she realizes it, but she realizes she wants to have Borgman around because A, he's, um, you know, he's an outlet um, or in a, a, a plan B type thing. Like it's it, you don't really understand like uh, at first what she wants right here because it doesn't really seem to be uh, like it's sexual attraction. It doesn't seem to be that it's um, that she wants to use him to kill Richard or anything. He just she just kind of wants him there, and that vagueness just permeates real life in a way that I think that 
I think this movie lands uh, for a lot of people is because a lot of people don't, un- they don't act normally like to what we would see. Like, I don't know why someone would make that decision. And to them, everything is perfectly rational. And I think this movie makes a point sometimes of being like, I'm not going to tell you why they're acting this way. I'm going to give you little bits ev- everywhere that seem to give you some sort of uh uh, narrative inclination of why they act this way because that's the expectation of a story is everybody acts within uh, a certain conceptual framework around edges like this is the central personality type of someone and they don't stray too far from that unless they are placed into a situation where um, they would they would act so far out of their character but it would be warranted be, be, by how strange the environment is but here everything just kind of feels the same way the whole way through but she is acting differently because we can't get into her mind. And that's ultimately the point, I think, which is which is the which is frustrating because why you're telling a story, right? Why are they acting so different from my conventions of characters and stories? Right, right. I think it's funny you say you can't get into her mind despite us being in her dreams. Right. Which is a really interesting point to make. I do want to move on to Richard, mm. uh, played by Yeron Perzival. Excellent. I think I, I think I nailed that one. I think you're getting good at this. So I really liked the way this movie handled him. I thought it was really smart. They set him up as, I think, the villain of this movie, despite us knowing that Borgman is like the real threat. He is aggressive, crude. Like he's there's the scene where he's just peeing in the backyard in front of everyone. I don't know if you what? remember that. Yeah, it's like uh, after Borgman, he's done the interview with him and Borgman's talking with Marina and he's just in the back of the frame. Just peeing in the backyard. Oh, that's what he's. I've watched this movie four times and I missed that. <laughs> I was so caught up on um, how Borgman was portrayed in that scene. Center of the frame, uh, the focus is a little soft in the outside, but right. it's just the interaction between the kids and Borgman, and because clearly they they recognize who this is. Right. Um, and so yeah, I missed the fact that he's just yeah, peeing he's in, the just in the back. It's but yeah, because he turns around, he's like zip up his pants and stuff. Um, but he's also, I mean, he's he's racist. He gets mad at Marina for suggesting that they hire a black gardener. Um, he's also then, very clearly classist, too. Yes. And then you have all the, the dream sequences of him, you know, brutally beating Marina. So I think it's really supposed to instill in the viewer is kind of like a deception that he's the bad guy. And, like, that's what we should be focused on when Borgman is, like, creeping around and is malevolent and is, is slowly kind of dismantling this family. So I, I really liked how Richard is using this. He's a, like an awful person, mm-hmm. but I think he functions in the movie really well. But he's still nuanced too, because there's a few times like like when Marina starts yelling at the children uh, about the or yelling at Isolde about the bear. Um, you know, things don't get deliberately broken in this house, and she he's like, "Why are you screaming at her like that?" And he just he uh, kisses Isolde and tells her, you know. Uh, mommy's just over it's just overworked she doesn't mean any of that and yeah. the same at the end when uh, Isolde gives him a kiss as he's uh, given as she gives him his wine uh, she, he's very tender and loving in those moments a lot of times it feels like he's he's just a hot head when provoked but otherwise a good person which is I think yeah what what makes him such an interesting character I have a theory I, I call that bear scene the kaput scene the kaput scene yeah um <laughs> I thought maybe you could look at it as uh, that's Marina expressing how much Borgman means to her and that if he was destroyed or removed from her life, like she would, it would, it would, she would struggle and she would be upset and she would be distraught. And like, she talks about how like this bear was made by someone who's not as well off, like maybe even by a child. And you could look at Borgman as that, like, cause when he's first introduced, he's, he's a vagrant, he's a drifter and he's not very well off and she feels the need to do something kind for him. And so to, have the bear represent that being destroyed. I thought maybe you could look at it that way. That was kind of the only thing I really pulled from that scene besides it just being kind of Marina having an outburst. Yeah. I kind of thought of it a little bit, um, an acknowledgement of the society that they live in, um, while at the same time, a deep level of hypocrisy. Like she is clear, like she has misplaced, uh, this bear is being uh, an object of her affection for Isolde, but uh, and tries to point out, look at how much went into the uh, the, the building of this bear, all the, how far it had to travel. Maybe even children made this bear, and without like understanding the how awful that is, like I'm the one that gave you this bear, not the fact that children made the bear. So I think it's more of a commentary, uh, a commentary on uh, 
the the process of stuff and love within the framework of a, a capitalist society. Um, I think it exists in a vacuum uh, apart from everything else, which is you have the we'll get into more of all of these different things but you have this the this religious component this supernatural component you have the uh uh social component and then all of the dreamy weirdness on top of it i think that's why like all of these things are given separate weight and they don't relate and that's why i think that we keep trying to put them together in a way that makes sense but i don't think that they do i think they they exist on their own within their own concept yeah no i I agree with that take. That's one of the things I think is fascinating about this movie is like, I don't think I'm necessarily wrong by making that comparison. No, I and I certainly so. don't think you're wrong by having that take on it either. And that's what keeps this movie like so intriguing to me is like, we can sit down and both have two different takes on, on one scene mm-hmm. and both pull something different from it. Yeah, exactly. I also think that Isolde is actually a really, I mean, she's the only one of the children that's interesting, but she's also interesting for a number of reasons because she, I think is the, the most psychopathic out of everyone. Oh, right. Because she, she kills the one gardener who comes to interview. Uh-huh. And like the way I think the scene is set up is that she's going to help him. And then she bashes his face in with a paver. Yeah. So it's, and then she just does a lot of creepy stuff throughout the movie. Like, you know, she takes, like we mentioned the bear already, taking the stuffing out and filling it with sand. and Almost like the way that they poured cement onto the, into the heads of uh the other gardeners and so that they would fall to the bottom of the the pond so i think the same thing like she is filling that bear with sand with dirt um pulling out its essence and putting in something else yeah no i i totally yeah you could i would have liked it better if she had poured sand into the bear's head then yeah instead of into the body of it another way of looking at that too is that was it was a rip on the on its back kind of like the scars yeah yeah we'll get into the scars later because uh, i definitely have theories and things i want to talk about that that's all like i think part two is going to be more theories and things like that but yeah that that daughter is like again she's the most intriguing of all of them and and again i don't really understand how she operates in this movie besides being really creepy yeah but i also think it worked for me i was it added another one of those like kind of a supernatural element to this yeah again like it feels like this movie is doing a lot of things and i don't really know what they amount to but i don't think i want any of those things removed like it doesn't make the movie less cohesive because I don't really think the movie is trying to be cohesive in the first place. So to have all these elements sprinkled in still fit the tone of the movie really well. So I don't need, I don't need an explanation for why she is the way she is. Yeah. And I think part of it is like, I think her dreams are also being poisoned by Camille, um, by Anton. Cause I think when we first get up, when he's first telling all of the kids, the, the story of the, the white child above the clouds, right? They're all awake. Um, and if the editing is true to how long it took Marina to get upstairs, they're already all asleep. And he was saying that uh, um, she was having a soul that was having a bad dream. I think he was giving her that bad dream and poisoning her mind to spur to the actions that she ultimately becomes. I think she is like kind of a um, probably already a little bit of a psych, uh, psychotic child, but he is putting those thoughts into her. He is, allowing those things to come to the forefront like oh i can act in this way i can act upon them and i think either that was a dream of her, of him telling a story to all of the children only in the soul of his mind or he was telling it to all of them separately in dreams yeah i like that idea a lot and you've already set that ability up in that character with how mm-hmm. he's influencing marina so i think that yeah that totally works there's uh yeah, i don't have like a hold of poke in that one yeah so i think it's a good theory but it's only momentary which is why like yeah again it's not like i I would what i would understand if someone would be like that doesn't make a lot of sense to me like yeah that uh, i can i can agree with that because it doesn't happen again we don't ever see him with the children asleep again he's telling stories later again but he is there now in in you know he's supposed to be there he's allowed to be there so it makes sense that he could be telling them a story so let's move on to the end trying to go through it without giving kind of theories on it because I think the ending is while it doesn't tie everything together or resolve it I think it's kind of where you flesh out a lot of the theories for this movie so what did you think of it just in terms of like how the overall movie, narrative like how quality. the movie concludes yeah yeah exactly because I think like yeah a lot of what these these first parts are, are just like 
movies as uh, as stories um, and what the story elements really are. And I think this this movie is so strange because it starts as the story of a vagrant on the run, and then it becomes something so wildly different. It's chaotic, uh, darkly funny parts, uh, but sinister, and not really about the character we followed at first. So I it ends with everyone leaving. Like it was never about stealing anything or displacing uh, Richard and Marina, but about adding members to their ranks. I, I there's a uh, I think you can just say that the title screen and they descended to strengthen their ranks. I think that you, you can, there's an argument to say that that's all this movie is. Um, Everything else is just there to confuse you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's, that's kind of what I, what I mean. Like that's the only consistent thing from beginning to end. Right. Yeah. They do it in a weird way. They don't do it. It seems consistently. They also could have not killed the gardener um, or the gardener applicant, or the wife. Or the other doctor. Yeah, or the doctor. There seems to be a whole lot of better yeah. ways to yeah. have strengthened their numbers. Um, but there's an argument that that's like, that is the point to this. But what's there's never like an acknowledgement of what they're doing or a motivation. There's just this yeoman-like quality to everything they're doing. Uh, it, des- it definitely feels like procedural. Mm-hmm. And, and I think it's kind of one of my thoughts is, is this what Borgman did to Ludwig and Pascal? And yeah. like, is that how he's gotten everyone mm-hmm. together with him? Like, I mean, maybe that doesn't work out so well unless the kids and uh, Stina end up getting powers later. Um, yeah. But it's also clearly been done to Borgman. Right. Yeah. So we, where, where does it, you know, it's turtles all the way down at that point. Like where did it all begin? But they leave with, there's no fanfare. It's not a, there's no deep scheme, no like little monologue, like, Oh, you're in my clutches or like a re- reveal of like what any of the plan was. Um, and there's no evil to it. I don't think these are the evil people. I don't think that the, any, the, the worst parts of, of the movie are ever done um, necessarily by them. Um, the evil was something that already existed within the feudal system, um, uh, within the capitalist state. And they are just, um, actors on behalf of that. I, I think I agree with that. Like, like I said, procedural, it's just something that they went out and did because like it's part of their programming or it's just what they do. I think this becomes an easier story about good and evil. I think, it, like you said, if there is that monologue at the end of where he's like, and then I got the children and my evil deed was was complete and, you know, something to that effect. Yeah. Or like the ending of whatever that poetic, the poetic quality of, and they descended upon the earth to strengthen their ranks. If there was some other poetic uh, device to finish that statement, that it feels like, you know, what was the, what was the, it's such an such an open ended statement. It's, right. There's no they. There's you know from where for what purpose. If any one of those had been answered, it would have been like, oh, that's interesting. But that ending then is so it's so vague. Like, why does it? You have all of these other elements. Why does it feel like it's saying so many things? But then it ends in such an anticlimactic way, despite the fact that they just buried two bodies in a pond that they just built. Right, right. That is definitely one of the things I went away from this film again, feeling like I didn't really know what it was about. Because it feels like it has a lot of like these little vignettes, a lot of small stories, uh, kind of attacking or um, describing like moral high ground or classism, or there's uh, bits about racism and stuff like that. So it felt like there was a lot of things included in this, and then for it to just end with it, it not being about you know supplanting this family and taking over their home to to so that they could live uh, a higher class life, and it wasn't really about indoctrinating the kids. I don't think even it wasn't. It wasn't about uh, Borgman having this affair or, or anything like that or, or you know, uh, seducing Marina, really. Right. It's not even like he, he was doing anything selfishly. Like, he absolutely could have taken advantage of her, but he was playing roles. And I right. think that's something we will talk about in the next one and when we when we get to more of, like, the social critique of this is the idea of that him playing the role of a vagrant and the role of a gardener and then the role of a leader of a band of Fay, I guess. I don't know what what to make of that part then. Like he's finished all of his jobs. Right. I I had made in my notes, I described them as a cult, but even as I was writing that, it didn't feel right either because it didn't feel like like Pascal was like tricked into doing this or something. It felt yeah. like he was complicit in it and he wanted to be a part of it. So that doesn't really feel like a cult-like quality to me. But again, I think this the ending of this, like you said, anticlimactic in a way that leaves you wondering what the hell did I just watch? 
And I still think that totally worked for me. Despite not diving into the theories we have on the end, I still think the movie ends in this really neat, ambiguous way that kept me wanting to research it and learn more about it, which I mm. definitely don't have uh, that that feeling when I watch something that's as straightforward. We talked about Tenet and how that movie is a visual spectacle, but like it's narratively empty. Mm-hmm. This movie, I, I would I think, is the opposite of that. It's not very spectacular cinematically, but there's so much going on to it with it that I wanted to learn more about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, and with that, I, I think we're going to wrap up part one. We'll get into... Uh, part two like our theories about this film kind of what is borgman like what is his crew are they some malevolent spirit are they fey like calvin mentioned and uh yeah we'll dive more into that uh later on again i think this movie is fascinating despite me not knowing what it's about and that's why it gets a part two because it's interesting to us yeah and because someone suggested it to us of course yeah again i i again big shout out to ruby nomad for suggesting this one i'll definitely reach out to you and let you know when this one's uploaded because uh it was so interesting to us that we wanted to build a two-parter out of it uh but with that uh go ahead and uh, search for us on any platform you want to find a pat- uh, podcast on like uh, apple music or spotify again we also upload all these to youtube go ahead and leave a comment uh we'll probably do whatever you suggest <laughs> um and with that i just want to thank uh resident film snob calvin for being on again oh, thanks for having me and uh thank you for listening to now this is podcasting <laughs>